Well, I'm thrilled to be here. Thank you, David. Thank you, Sarah, for inviting me to be a part of this amazing endeavor. I'm really excited to be here and to meet all of you um, and have a seminar with you tomorrow and project design sessions tomorrow afternoon. So um, this is the beginning of a conversation. And um, I guess I wanted to, but I wanted to start, besides my expressing my gratitude to all of you for being here, is uh, to say what this is not. This talk is not going to teach you in thorough detail how to do scholarly editing. It's not going to teach you how to do TEI. It's not going to teach you how to do oxygen to make XML encoded texts. So those are things that we couldn't possibly do in an hour, right? But my, um, but my hope is that I'll give you a set of resources that you can use to pursue any of those goals should that be of interest to you. Um, also, I want to acknowledge that um, after reading your, your quick bios, um, maybe only a, a few of you are interested possibly in encoding texts. Um, could I see a show of hands? In doing what? Encoding texts or making digital editions. Yeah, yeah. A couple of you? Okay, great, great. Oh, good, more than I thought. Fabulous. So, but at the same time, despite that interest, which I'm delighted to see, um, some of you, I, I, I'm prepared for your eyes to glaze over a little bit. Um, and yet, I want to argue that even if you might find yourself in that category, um, I think that these tools and these um, theories that we're going to be talking about actually will affect all of you who teach or do research in creating digital performances or talking about them or writing about them. So um, I hope you'll, you'll, you'll listen to this in terms of a, a basic boot camp in what scholarly editors do and documentary editors in particular and how we uh, theater historians, theater um, historiographers, etc., theater teachers, can be guided by the decades of um, work that scholarly editors have done, both in print and digitally. So um, I, th I was trying to think, what would I like you to be able to do by the end of this talk, or by the end of our two days together? And these are the five things that I hope you'll, have, you'll be able to approach doing. So the first one is, I'd love it if you would be able to describe some of the practices, the best practices in documentary editing, which is a field in itself and a community in itself. So uh, knowing some of those best practices, I think, helps us understand and design, understand projects that we encounter and also design our own. Um, I also hope you'll be able to articulate how these processes that have been around for a very long time are different to and similar in digital documentary editing because there are some crucial and interesting differences, but also crucial and interesting similarities. Um, thirdly, I hope you'll be able to identify potential sources of funding for digital documentary editing, because there's, there's plenty of it out there. Um, fourth, I hope you'll, you'll know where to seek additional info and training. Like I was saying before, we can't do that this, th these next uh, two days, but if you want to learn more, I'm, I'm going to offer you some resources for that. And then finally, um, because I imagine most of you teach in some way or another, in some context or another, how I'd like you to be able to have some ideas about how to integrate these concepts into your teaching. Okay. So this is the itinerary. Toward, the, toward those ends, I'm going to first talk about our project, the Harry Watkins Diary Project, and um, give you a basic kind of foundation using this as a case study. Then I'll talk about these best practices in traditional documentary editing I was talking about. And then talk about how these translate into digital editing. So sort of like, a, uh, I'll show you a slide with the best practices in traditional editing and then digital editing, same concepts. And then I'll talk more specifically about how we applied these practices to our digital edition project. Um, then we'll talk about funding and pedagogy at the end. So if we, if we find that we're running short on time, we may save pedagogy for tomorrow, I was thinking, because Emily actually has a lot of experience and ideas about using um, digital scholarship in our teaching. So we could just pick up that thread tomorrow if we, want, if we want. OK, so the project is called A Player and a Gentleman, because that's what Harry Watkins was. <laughs> um, the Diary of Harry Watkins, a 19th century US American actor. And this has been a collaborative project from the beginning between Naomi and me, as well as our technology director, Scott Dexter. And, and 
I, they're, they're excited that we're uh, talking about this today, but I miss them desperately uh, because, of course, they can answer some questions that I can't and know that they are your resources as well as me going forward should you be interested in learning more. Um, I, I apologize profusely, but our website is down um, right now. It's migrating, we're migrating servers. They said it would take three to ten days. It's not taken that long. Um, so instead, very briefly, I, I offer you two alternatives. Um, this is the, oh, maybe I can't. Okay, I can't. But um, you can do it on your own machines. Harry has a Twitter feed. So if you'd like to go to Twitter, please follow him. It's at Watkins Diary. At Watkins Diary. And each day he, um, he tweets... Uh, 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 basically, we give a tweet of, from the diary what he wrote 117 years ago. So um, I hope you'll follow us, and it gives you just quick snippets of what the diary is like and what he was like, and it's, and it's a lot of fun. We even get pe people sort of responding or commenting occasionally on these tweets. Um, and, uh, and so that's sort of our website at the moment. But hopefully by the time the Institute's over, you, you could check us out. Um, and... And right now, you can look at the manuscript itself um, at the Harvard Hollis catalog. As part of this project, we, we paid for a facsimile of the manuscript, which is 1,300, I'm sorry, 1,200 pages, um, 13 volumes, and about 400,000 words. So our first step was to scan the entire manuscript, and you can see that online at Harvard. So that URL is for you there. So this is Harry Watkins, um, and he was, uh, he, his career spanned, he spanned more than 40 years. He was an actor, manager, and playwright. His career was, I like to call him, he was barely above average. <laughs> barely above average. <laughs> and this is important because so many documentary editing projects focus on the rich, famous, and important, right? And, and so when, when I found his diary, well, first of all, um, a few sh shots of him as an actor, he focused on low comedy. Uh, eventually, uh, he began as a juvenile, uh, playing juvenile role leads and leading men and tragic roles, but eventually he figured out that he was most popular as a low comedian. So these are some of my favorite pictures of him in character. Um, I found out about him because of this book, published in 1938. Uh, and this, was a, this is basically a biography of Watkins featuring extensive excerpts from the manuscript by Maud and Otis Skinner. Um, and I noticed that in all of the 19th century theater history I was reading, everyone was citing this book. Pretty much everyone in my field, my little subfield. And I thought, well, where's the diary? Did it survive? Is it some, somewhere in the world? And um, long story short, after I sort of brainstormed about where it could have landed, the sort of the genealogy of, of pr a possible provenance, and discovered that the Skinner family had donated their papers to Harvard Theater Collection. And even though the, there was no finding aid, um, I, I asked a very, uh, the lovely librarian, Bet, uh, Betty Falsey, um, who has helped many of us to search for this manuscript that I really hoped was there, and she found it sort of lodged in an old box that had no label. So it was a very exciting moment. That was 10 years ago. <sighs> 10 years ago. <laughs> so I put it aside because that's, this is not a, a pre-tenure project. Um, focused on my first book. And um, when I got that under control, I asked Naomi, who has a master's degree in life, Lives and Letters, uh, to work with me on this project because most documentary editing projects are collaborative. Just as um, Catherine Hales in the reading that was assigned for yesterday says that most digital projects are collaborative, so our do you know, a documentary editing project is one is, a, is similarly collaborative. So um, this is what it looked like. This is what it looks like. And um, you can go and look at it, and I, I hope you will if, it, if this at all interests you. And after we started talking about it, we started with what would our objective for such a project of bringing this, doc this document to a larger audience in, its, um, in, in a couple of forms, we hoped. 
uh, what would its major objective be? And this was what we came up with, to make it accessible to a wide range of readers, both in print and online. So it's always been envisioned as a hybrid project. But also, it's a born digital project because we didn't, we began um, the transcription process in XML using TEI, uh, a TEI schema. And we envisioned that we could use that encoded text to generate what would eventually become the print edition, which is coming out in October. So the print edition is roughly 40% of the diary corrected and edited for enhanced readability. This, is, this goes to that purpose of reaching a wide range of readers. Harry Watkins' prose is, is pretty engaging. He's got a good sense of humor. It's a good read, I think, and um, there are moments when people, like students who've worked with us have been transcribing, I'll talk about that later, and they will laugh out loud because he's, he's just funny. And we wanted to be able to create a text that could be readable and enjoyable and give a glimpse in this um, nice, engaging way of the 19th century theater through his words and his, and his diary. It also has um, an introduction written by Naomi and me, annotations, to help again with that accessibility to all readers. Maps that depict his travels each theater season because the, the diary spans 15 years and it's broken up by season. And indices because of course this is one of the most important ways we can make this text helpful to people who are looking up specific subjects or want to learn more about say George Washington Watkins, Harry's brother. They can go to the index, blah, 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 blah. Just like in any book you've read but um, the feedback we were getting from people we shared samples with said we really want to see all the people, all the plays in, in one index, index. So that's been one of the more gargantuan components, but, and we're working on those right now. The digital edition will be the entire diary, but it will not be corrected. It will be raw. All his bad spelling, all his bad punctuation that makes it difficult, um, all of his errors. So. In that, and they won't, they won't, it won't have that support that the print edition has in terms of annotation. Um, it will be hosted and maintained, however, by Michigan Library's Digital Collections. This was one of the, the, the decisions, um, one of the decision-making factors on which press to go with was influenced, as you can imagine, by how we could have both editions have a life and a common home. And luckily, Michigan uh, has this very robust digital collections arena or arm and a, and a very mission driven um, sense of making text accessible free to a wide range of readers. So this is another, a, a reason why we're, we're working with them and we're so happy that they, they see the merit in this project. Um, it will be free. Um, there will be extra resources that a book can't necessarily hold uh, because of word count and so forth, budget, and it will include the introduction that appears in the print edition, because you would, you would find that on Google Books as well, right? That's our logic. But it won't have the annota annotations. It won't be a corrected text. It'll have, however, a bibliography of secondary sources and any ar additional archival material that we think might supplement readers' um, experience. Luckily, the Harvard Theater Collection, particularly Matthew Whitman, the curator, is very enthusiastic about this project, getting the manuscript out there, and has basically said, after many years of conversation, we'll give you whatever you need um, in terms of the archival resources. Isn't that amazing? So the lesson in that is, you know, talk to your 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 the people who have your your documents because they will often be just so excited about what you're doing and help you um, make it feasible. And then um, the most important thing is it will be searchable by keywords. So because it's so long and dense, the, the, and it's, in, it's handwriting, which very few people these days, especially students, can read, it's almost unusable unless you had, like I did a whole summer to read it in two months. So we realized that making this text, transcribing it, uh, making it searchable was going to make it useful in a way it, it is not in, it, in its current form. But also through using XML, um, we're tagging text so that hopefully, and this is what Michigan Libraries will do for us, people can not only search for Hamlet by keyword, but also designate whether they're interested in the play or the role, for example. So that we'll have context, contextual searching or more, more fine-tuned searching in this digital edition 
therefore making it more useful to a wide range of readers who have different um, goals. Maybe they're geneal genealogy people looking for particular um, information about their families. Maybe they're theater scholars. Maybe they're students working on a project. We don't know, but the more useful and flexible we can make this, we figure the better. So that was what has guided our encoding, as I'll talk about later. Um, and then it will also link to the digital facsimile of the manuscript, as I showed you earlier. This is what it looks like at Harvard. You can scroll through, um, but, but it's hard to find what you're looking for because it's just by page number and not date. And he didn't date his entries very helpfully either. Um, <laughs> he, only the beginning, the first of each month, does he list the month, for example. And the year only appears on January 1st. So thanks, Harry. Um, but that's what we're here for. Um, so on to the next, that's our overview of the project. The, the next thing I wanted to talk about is um, what is traditional documentary editing? Because from the beginning I knew that I had no idea what documentary editors did. I've used so many documentary editions. They've hu hu hugely helped me as a scholar. But I didn't know the first thing about how these are put together, what the best practices are, etc. So luckily, um, I found out very early on from uh, a scholar, K. Wise Whitehead, um, that the Association for Documentary Editing exists. And its purpose is to uh, create and establish conversation, best practices, and support among documentary editors in all disciplines. So um, that's the first and foremost uh, helpful resource I wanted to offer you. Uh, the MLA also has a committee on scholarly editions. And um, and then finally, TEI. Most of you have heard about TEI by now. Maybe not. It's okay if you haven't. But, but the Text Encoding Initiative is huge and crucial for those of us who are digitizing texts or making digital editions of anything that is based on text. So a little bit more about the TEI. Its mission is, or what it is, is a consortium which collectively develops and maintains a standard for the representation of texts in digital form. Now, of course, as we know and you've been discussing, I'm sure, uh, technologies are changing all the time. So the reason why the TEI convened and continues to do its work is because XML is a relatively stable uh, markup system. And you can use other kinds of technology as they emerge to take that raw text and transform it into something usable. So the consortium uh, talks about um, what are these best practices in textual markup that we can use to translate into an interface at the whim or will of the designers later in the future, et cetera. And it's now, it, the guidelines are now in their fifth edition. So they're, it's not a constant concrete thing, but it is a community of folks who are trying to do this well and consistently. And um, there's training available in TEI. And it's been a, a huge education for me. Um, and I encourage all of you to learn more about it. So as you transcribe a text, you tag with using the, um, you tag different words or different components or sections of the text using tags. Like div, for example, is division. So you might have div type equals page, or div type equals entry in our diary, for example. Um, so there's, they're nested too. So you might have div, but there are all kinds of types you could put in. And you can even, if you decide in your schema, create custom types, depending on your needs or the, your manuscript's um, essence or structures. Uh, you, in a manuscript, we often have additions and deletions. So you can tag those as adds or deletes, open tag, close tag, open, you know, add, and then uh, slash and add, right? Um, same with deletion. Names, and you can again have an infinite almost number of types of names, so people, places, etc. So you can tag text that way. Titles, we've tagged every play title, and there are many, many, many in the manuscript with the title tag. And this is just a sample of, of the, some of the tags that we use in accordance with these guidelines. And our project is based on sort of TEI basic. Um, schema, although it has some tweaks and customizations, but the beauty of TEI is it's, there, there's, it's standards so that you can ensure sustainability of your encoding, but also it has some flexibility built in so you can, because every manuscript is different, every text is different. 
So for a couple of, of links for you to the guidelines are there and um, they always list training events if you want to attend a workshop, whether um, standalone or at a conference, they're happening all the time and other online opportunities to learn TEI can also be found there. So what is traditional documentary editing? Um, when I was putting this together, I couldn't remember where I got these words. <laughs> They're so ingrained. Um, and I, I realized that they're actually from the NEH uh, Scholarly Editions Grant Program Guidelines. They asked, uh, they asked us when we applied for an NEH grant um, to talk about all of these things in our edition. Now, this vocabulary is also used by the Association for Documentary Editing and, it's, and in all kinds of publications around scholarly editing, but um, I thought it might be helpful to stick with this because, again, it's what the funder is interested in our talking about. And, the, and the, the best practices in their eyes can be very interesting and shape our projects in helpful, crucial ways. So that's why I'm offering these to you. The first one is document control, which sounds sort of like a scary phrase, but um, it basically means organizing documents, keeping track of them, making sure that they remain safe. So in traditional print-oriented editing, that has been often has been paper files, file folders with photocopies of documents that you are transcribing and eventually publishing, um, databases where you have an item for every document or every thing that you're transcribing. So um, so that seems familiar. That's familiar, right? Um, transcription is obviously a stage where there's a lot of best, best practices. If you um, are interested in learning more. They eventually translate into what we call editorial policies. So Harry Watkins, for example, um, he uses a lot of dashes. When we were deciding early on how are we going to ask our transcribers to interpret different kinds of punctuation, we decided we don't want them to interpret any punctuation. We just want them to, to write what they see, transcribe what they see. So there were tons and tons of dashes. Unfortunately, in XML, a dash is this funky four-letter character because it's XML, and they had to do that every single time. But we wanted to have our transcription, our policy was going to be to represent the text as closely as possible as it appears on the page. And then we would deal with any changes later. And indeed, when we, we uh, created the manuscript for the print edition, a lot of those dashes became periods and commas for readability, right? But we still have in our, our transcription all of that original punctu punctuation. So uh, this is just one of many examples of endless debates, some of them heated, Naomi and I had, about how we would transcribe the handwriting of Harry Watkins and what, how we would tag them, too. So um, these are things that you want to start and do as early as possible so that you aren't going back and changing things once you've discovered, actually, I made a mistake in this policy or this approach or this choice towards transcription. Um, the more planning you do, the more thought you put in in the beginning, the less work later, the less fixing later. So the next stage is verification, which is verifying that you're, you've accurately rendered the text. And um, the best practice generally for this is tandem proofreading, which means one person reading the manuscript or the printed page, the source, and one person checking and marking the transcription. So we decided we would do this, and if, in fact, we would do it twice because we're two editors and we work in teams of two with a student. So we each page went through a tandem proofreading, first with, with me or Naomi, and then with the other editor, and um, edits along the way. Selection uh, means what things, if you're not, especially if you're not <coughs> going to publish the entire co corpus or document, what are you going to select and why? Because Part of one of the best practices of documentary editing is transparency. You want to state very explicitly for your reader what you've changed, what, ch what changes you've made on the sentence level of text, like dashes and periods and commas, but also wh why you've included certain things and what you've left out. So that the reader, you know, you, you're creating that trust with the reader and they can also know that there's more to f seek out that is omitted should they desire. So selection criteria is another one of these concepts that's, that's crucial to editing. <coughs> Presentation is another. How will the edition look, ultimately, on the page, on the screen, et cetera? And um, 
for many years, or one, one example of, of a debate over presentation is um, the notion of barbed wire. So this is an example of barbed wire. This is an attempt to render as closely as possible in print what is on a manuscript page. And you can see the strike throughs, the, the, the superscript, the, the brackets, and, um, and, this, and yet this is very, oh, these arrows that indicate an addition. So yes, you're getting a lot of information if you as a reader know what that arrow means, but it's difficult to read, isn't it? It's like barbed wire. So there was a moment when, and you'll read about this tomorrow in the excerpts that I, I've provided for the seminar in the morning, um, the, the debate over barbed wire is a heated one in documentary editing, which is why um, clear text editions is another approach, which is what we would say the print edition of Harry Watkins Diary is. It's a clear text edition in that you do not see a lot of that um, raw, it, the errors, the additions, the deletions in the print edition. It's meant to be readable. It's meant to be engaging. Um, it's meant to be accurate, but also updated in a way that's user friendly. And then the final, um, the final thing that you can have to consider is annotation. This is a big, you know, of course it means annotations as in footnotes, but also anything we do as editors on top of the text or in addition is a form of annotation. So will you have an introduction? Will you have images, illustrations like we did with maps? That's a form of annotation. Appendices, indices, these are things that you too need to think about in advance given whatever your goals are for your edition. So how does this translate into digital documentary editing? It's similar. Document control is, of course, vital in digital projects. We have, um, we have to make sure they remain safe. They can disappear like that um, if we do not protect them, if we do not secure them in some way, back them up. Um, cloud services, though, um, are, as, are not just valuable for backup, but also collaboration so that we can have a project team like ours on three campuses, really far away from each other, it being New York City, and still have, um, be touching base constantly and be, not have duplicate documents. So, so the digital environment offers that opportunity with document control that's, that's great. Um, also, there's a, a many, many projects use co document, well, content management systems that are more elaborate than, say, your excess database, which is what traditional documentary editing might have used as a go-to resource. In our case, we use Drupal. So um, you may need a tool that's a bit more robust to manage your documents, and, and there are opportunities for that. Um, and there's something here that is less, that's more important in digital editing, perhaps, or arguably than print editing, that's sustainability, that I consider part of document control in particular, um, but it certainly applies to everything, including presentation, the ultimate publication of your document or your edition. Um, in the beginning, you have to be thinking, this is a digital edition, how can I make it sustainable? Because it's not going to be a book in a library. And, um, and so this is one reason we decided to use TEI, was so that we could make our text sustainable, regardless of whatever fashions existed at the moment of its publication. Um, <coughs> around technology. Also hosting, uh, we decided to partner with a library rather than say our department, one of our departments or our IT uh, division at Brooklyn College, which is notoriously terrible. Uh, I'm sure you have experiences like that too. Um, but with a, with a library that's, that's committed to um, sustainability as well and access in perpetuity of its resources and has committed a lot of investment to that, so, um, so even when this was just an idea, we were starting to have conversations with different people we imagined hosting the edition and brainstorming about ways we could do it early on at this stage of document control. Um, transcription is different in the digital environment, as I've been saying, you might use XML, you might use a different form of markup, you might go and, and learn about TEI standards and, and create a schema. Um, verification. Is, has the added benefit, the digital environment has the added benefit of being changeable in a way that print editions are not, arguably, because, uh, and we're hoping to do this with Michigan, we will find errors that we want to fix, or we will learn things that we'd like to change in the XML. So 
having a way to do that is, is important to us and we hope to partner with them to make that happen. So that's another consideration as you're planning, as you're developing your project to keep in mind in this category of verification. Um, selection. So often with digital, in the digital environment, we, we assume that we have infinite space um, but that's not always helpful to the user, right? So selection is still important to think about in the digital environment, I argue. Um, at the same time, we can't have all the playbills that Harry Watkins collected in six volumes as they exist at uh, Oakland University in Michigan. Um, we cannot do that in the book. We could theoretically do that in the digital environment. Would we? I'm not sure yet. They exist only on Flickr right now <laughs> for us. Um, if you're curious, I'm happy to give you a glimpse. But, but these are, we, you know, there's something about when you're an editor, you are editing, right? You are curating. So still, you have to think about um, selection, I think, even in the digital environment. Um, though it does present great opportunities that print does not. Presentation. Um, I think in digital editing, Access is the most important thing to be thinking about. Um, one of the great powers we have in, as digital humanists is um, the opportunity to make information more widely available than print ever did. And, and yet, for a very long time, digital editions, especially of the, of the more important documentary editing projects, were behind paywalls. And that continues to be the case. So if you believe in the principle of free access, um, find a creative solution to get that access to your people, but, but still maybe meet the other goals of your project. So for, for just as an example, we knew we wanted there to be a print edition of this diary because for many people, a print, um, a print edition is the go-to resource for a manuscript like this. It's also in great need, um, it's a great need for 19th century scholars. Like I said before, so many of my colleagues have cited this very bad 1938 book that has bad, it's badly transcribed, it's, there's outright errors, there are outright lies about what the manuscript says. <laughs> um, and so I felt like the great, a great service I could do for my profession and for my colleagues and for my students was to create a book that could be acquired by a library um, or a scholar and, and have that resource available. Um, but a publisher also wants to know that their, the book that they're publishing will maybe make its money, make the investment back, right? So one of the considerations we had early on was how can we make digital edition free but different enough that the book would still have an audience and a purpose. And, and that's why um, there's so little editorial convention in the digital edition. It's sort of right there for you. You can search it, you can do things with it um, on your own. But if you want the, re the research that we've done about Harry Watkins, if you want the corrected version so that you understand, oh, that's not Henry, Miss Henry, the dancer with a Y, but with an I, so you can find more about her, that's, where you f that's the, the accurate text. And this is what we worked out with Michigan, and they were totally on board with that, and hooray, it's, it's happening. But the, again, in the planning phases that we were discussing that very early on, how do we make these two projects distinct so we can have one that's free, and, and very usable, but also something that's um, going to be useful in a different way and help support the press's valuable work as an academic press. And then finally, annotation also applies in the digital environment because you can offer those supplementary materials, you can curate those supplementary materials for your users, but at the same time, um, there are copyright considerations that you need to keep in mind. Uh, this, just this past week, we had an hour-long conversation with the, the, the digital uh, collections people at Michigan about copyright. So the tagging you've done, is that a different text? Is that a copyrightable text? And we had, we had literally an hour, we were going back and forth because we had never actually had this conversation. Do we, is there something to copyright in the digital edition? And after that conversation, we decided that no, it's, it isn't copyrightable because what we've done is, is try to represent the document through code through an encoded XML transcription. We aren't embedding annotations that we've researched or written ourselves. Um, the introduction is already copyrighted because it's appearing in the book, and so we'll do that. But um, these are things that will come up, and we can talk more about them if you've got questions. And um, 
And, and that applies to anything that's part of your digital edition, not just the transcription. So <coughs> these are things to remember as well. So a few more details um, about how our project dealt with some of these considerations. So as I mentioned, we used Google Drive and Dropbox to collaborate on documents like our editorial policies document, which was constantly evolving, unfortunately. Uh, it is no longer evolving because we're almost done, but it was something that had to be constantly maintained and changed and edited and updated. So uh, we used these basic document sharing services for that. Um, we transcribed from JPEGs of the manuscript that we had acquired from the first grant I got to work on this project. Um, there are, however, of course, images, facsimiles are not the same as looking at the page. So we also had to make several visits um, to look at pages that the facsimile could not, um, you know, there's something confusing or we couldn't identify. So nothing can fully replace the manuscript, but thank goodness we had a facsimile, otherwise we could not have done this work. Um, we also, as I mentioned, used uh, Drupal as our content management system, which is a, uh, a really great customizable um, open source system. Um, you, you can make websites with it, which we did, but in our case, uh, Scott created and customized it so that each page would have a transcription. And um, in the handout that I've created for you all that's on the course site, um, Jason kindly gave, put that up there, as well as this PowerPoint um, presentation, because there's URLs and things. I thought it would be useful to you. Um, but anyway, you'll see the stages of, of transcription and verification and review that we went through and each, the Drupal workbench module was basically our workflow system that allowed us to have a page move through each stage of transcription, review, trans revision, uh, review again, and finally editorial um, sort of rubber stamp or more changes and then finalization. So Drupal was very helpful for that um, document control aspect of the project. And um, there are sus some sustainability issues that remain. For example, harrywalkinsdiary.org, which sadly, as I said, is down because we, it's our website. Um, it, we hope it will be indefinitely available, but that's what we maintain. Um, we pay for it. We update it. Sometimes it breaks, and it's our responsibility to fix it. It doesn't feel 100% sustainable to me because I don't know if I will want to be doing this 10 years, 20, 30 from now, and I will die too. You know, we all die. So, um, so there are some issues that we haven't fully resolved, but we're mindful of them and we're trying to our best to make aspects of our project sustainable. And as I said, the decision to partner with UMichigan um, was one of those sustainability um, issues that we're happy to have resolved to the best of our ability for the digital and print editions. So, Transcription, as I said, we, we created uh, transcription, written transcription policies to help our transcribers transcribe the text consistently and accurately. We created a, a pretty basic but somewhat customized TEI schema for the project to assist with that. We used Oxygen, which is XML editing software, to actually do the transcribing to help make it more efficient um, and easier and more accurate because it will tell you when there's an error in the code and that's crucial. Um, so Oxygen was really helpful to use, and as I said, the workbench module in Drupal became our document control system and the place where we collected those transcriptions. During the verification process, we, we did the tandem proofreading twice, and one great thing about Drupal that helps us with verification is every version is saved. So if something made it all the way through the eight stages and is still wrong, or if I'm looking, and if I'm looking and I'm thinking, I, I swear I corrected that, we can go back and look at the history, similar to Wikipedia or any wiki, and see every version, which I think is uh, really important for verification. It's not something, it's something you would get with paper files, right? In, in traditional documentary editing, you'd have a marked up copy of an earlier version, you would put in a file and you could refer to it. In the electronic environment, you need that too, and Drupal lets you do that. So that, that's a crucial part of verification as well. Um, how we'll be verifying or making changes to the text after it's on the Michigan Library's website, I don't know, as I said before, I'm not sure, but it's something that we want to do and, be, and to be able to do, so um, it's something that we will work on. 
This is a screenshot of the workbench in Drupal. I'm sorry that it's hard to read, but you do have the PowerPoint um, on the course site if you want to zoom in. So this is a user profile, and you can see, um, or this is, this is Danielle, one of our uh, editorial assistants who is working with us. And you can see each page has a number, and it matches the number at Harvard um, as they supplied them. So don't change things. <laughs> You know, that was one thing we decided early on, why rename the pages for our convenience, because it still lives at Harvard forever, we hope, we expect, and let's be consistent, it will make things easier later. So even though it's a, a bit hard to know where you are, that's, how we, we, that's why we kept it that way. Um, you can see when she last reviewed or revised the file, or which remember these are each a page. Each this is an image, and then each image has a transcription in XML. Um, and you can also see all content. So, for example, in this the, in this sort of dashboard for Danielle, she can also see um, from the beginning, the first page in the collection one one one. Um, Shane was the last person to edit that. Shane Bro, by the way, some of you know Shane Bro. He's been with this project from the beginning. Um, he did all of the maps in the print edition. They're beautiful and amazing, and we could not have done this project without Shane. Um, and he, and so you can see other people's work as well. And the moderation state shows what stage it's in. So these are all pages because they're early on in the file that have been through every stage of transcription, revision, and verification, and now needs final approval. Um, and this is again. Sorry about the size, but you can look at it on your own. When you are looking at a page, this is the page view in the Drupal workbench. So you can see the image of the page. This is the transcription in XML. So you could copy and paste this, put it into a text, an XML reader, and have it rendered in whatever way you want, like using XSLT or what have you. But we also had a place to add comments for every page so that if an editorial assistant had a question, they could write it down. If they had done some research about a name, we didn't want to lose that time or that information so we could add a comment on the page itself and again, have that saved and preserved for future work endeavors, etc. The selection process for us was um, for the print edition based on word count. You know, we had a contract with the press and so that dictated how much of the diary we could put in. It was really hard uh, to decide what to leave out, what to omit, and it ended up being about 40%. And um, we decided that for our main readership, the, the information, the stories, the narratives he had about his life as a theater professional was probably the most relevant and interesting. Um, and then what he had to say about the very interesting, fraught um, politics and social concerns percolating between 1845 and 1860, which as you know, in the US, very intense time, many issues being discussed. And we left all of that in because we thought that would be appealing to a wide range of readers, not just theater scholars and students. And then, um, and, that, and that meant, oh, and, and we also kept in entries that showed where he was traveling, because he traveled all over the place and you would get lost if you didn't know that on day one, he was going to take the cars to Albany, at which point he was going to get a steamship, at which point he was then going to get a mule, which he did <laughs> once, to go to his next, de next destination. So even though some of those entries are not very interesting, we felt like for the narrative experience of the reader, we needed to leave that in so they'd have a sense of the story. But some of the best things he wrote are in there. It's so hard. But because we made the criteria, we knew we couldn't keep the story about how someone took his umbrella um, by mistake at a restaurant, I think, and he has this whole funny narrative about it, um, writing a letter to said gentleman and transcribing the letter and, and so forth. And we were just like, you know, we really wish this could stay, but it doesn't meet our criteria. And every time we had that, that kind of conversation, we'd say, well, anyone who really cares can search umbrella in the digital edition. Or we could ask them to. Um, so, so these are these are some of the thing, the ways that selection affected us. Um, and then in the digital edition, as I said, we get the, the great um, privilege of sharing the entire diary with you and making it available to everyone for free. 
In terms of the print edition for presentation, as I said, we wanted the text to be accessible and readable. Our goal really is for undergraduates even to be able to pick up one season and, and get a good story and be able to not stumble so much through it that they become disengaged. And I think we've succeeded with that. Um, we'll see, but um, our students, as I said, have responded so enthusiastically to some of his stories that we hope we, we'll accomplish that in the print edition. But um, not only for um, scholarly purposes, but also for differentiation, reasons of differentiation with the print edition, we've not corrected the digital version or the digitized text, and it's as close to what he wrote as possible. Um, and yet we can, we can offer you the ability to search it. Annotation, um, as I mentioned, these are the ways we've been annotated the print. In the digital, um, we have some forms of annotation, but uh, these are mostly things that we couldn't fit for reasons of space in volume, um, or because it'd be too complicated, or be easier to actually access or see them. A playbill does not render very well on a page, but online, you can really zoom in and get a lot of information from it. So uh, it will have that kind of annotation. Now, moving on to funding. <gasps> okay, funding. You are going to hear from a, pro a program director on Thursday from the NEH, right? Mm -hmm. So I won't talk a lot about this. Um, and in fact, I may be, I, please know that this is not an exhaustive list, and it may not even be fully accurate. If you've got questions about any of these programs, I hope you'll ask her. Victoria, I think? Victoria. Victoria. But very briefly, these are the things that we looked at as theater scholars creating a digital edition of a, a theater document. Um, first and foremost, the scholarly editions and translations program caught our eye. Alas, we did not get this grant. We tried several times. I'm glad we did, even though we did not get it, because it really shaped our project in incredibly productive ways. So that's one thing I want to leave, I hope you will remember is that the, and you, I know you probably know this, but the exercise of writing a grant actually teaches you so much about your project. It strengthens it in important, incalculable ways. And that was certainly the case with us. Indeed, I don't think this project would have ever happened had I not read the guidelines for the scholarly editions and translations program and realized I could not apply for that grant without a partner, without a collaborator. And um, that was a moment in my career where I was looking at this manuscript and to have this love-hate relationship with Harry. And, and I thought, I can't, I, I can't not do this. I don't want to do this. But then, oh, maybe I could apply for this grant. And oh, right, I know Naomi Stubbs. And she's brilliant. And we complement each other so well. And it would be fun to do this with her. So um, in, in that very pivotal, basic way, the grant changed the project because it had to be collaborative. It's so much stronger as a result. So anyway, the, the, this program requires you, in the guidelines it says, tell us how your project conforms to best practices of the ADE or the MLA. So that's why I gave you all that information about best practices, is because if you were to seek out funding from these sources, you would need to demonstrate that knowledge. Um, it's a nice amount of money. Um, 100,000 over three years, I think, maybe more. And uh, it's a very nice funding ratio. That's what FR means. 22% of the applications get funded. In contrast, the awards for faculty, which is the one you're prob the program you're most familiar with, I think, only 8%. So uh, it's, it, I think it's good to sort of like, you have limited resources of time and energy, and I think that even though that's, it's still only one in five, it's still a, it's a pretty good um, opportunity for us to get the resources we need to do this work. They also have uh, digital humanities advancement grants. They have to be innovative in some way, whereas the, the scholarly editions grants are much, are, they have to exhibit, those projects have to exhibit what we would call traditional documentary editing practices and, and presentations or publications. Um, the advancement grants seem to be more interested in, in a product that has something new to it, a new way for users to engage, or a new interface, or what have you. That was not something that we were doing with this project, so we never applied for it, but I just wanted to put this on this list because it's such an important program for us as a community. And again, 15% funding ratio, which is still better than the individual grants. And then um, 
there, this is also interesting. I, I've not applied for this, but I noticed it researching this presentation today that there's this, the NEH Mellon Fellowships for Digital Publication. They're only one year grants, similar to the awards for faculty. Uh, same amount, 60K for a year. Similar funding ratio, but it's, it's interesting, I think, that the publication or the product can be interpretive, so it can be scholarship. Um, your your um, take on the subject at the center of your project, not just presenting it in an assimilative way, to use Hale's term. So um, the, again, not an exhaustive list, but just a, a place for you to begin and maybe ask questions on Thursday of the program director. Some other major sources of funding for documentary editing include the NHPRC and the ACLS. So here are some facts about them. Again, with the NHPRC, which is, has uh, federal funding, you need to demonstrate that knowledge of best practices in documentary editing as described by the ADE and the MLA, or, sorry, not and, the MLA. You can get quite a bit of money to support your project. Um, it's a highly competitive program, however, they don't even give you the funding ratio, but just know that, um, even, especially as funding for documentary editing has steadily declined, um, it, it's very difficult to get one of these grants from the NHPRC. We didn't try. We figured um, with, a, with someone like Harry Watkins, whose significance is not immediately clear to everyone, and indeed, the feedback we got every round that we applied, there was one person who said, I don't see why an actor's diary is significant enough to fund. And we, every year we sharpened our argument, sharpened it, sharpened it, sharpened it. It got better and better and those scores went up. But every year somebody said, this guy, I don't know him. I don't understand why his take is important and so forth. So we just figured, let's focus on the NEH and indeed, Ultimately, Naomi got a, an award for faculty to support the project, but only as an, as an individual. Because that panel understood they were panel scholars, not documentary editors, and they saw the significance of the project. So, in a different way. Anyway, um, ACLS also has um, a digital program I wanted to be sure you knew about. 12 to 18 month grant period, up to 150,000. Um, and they don't say anything about ADE or MLA standards, but I, I, my sense is, Know, knowing some of the folks who work there and being on, on grant panels myself, um, that you, you're, you're instilling confidence in, a, in, a, in your peers when you can demonstrate you have a sense of best practices. So I would, not, I would certainly um, get some more information and help and mentoring in that before applying. So how do you get that mentoring? How do you get that information? Well, I, I had to get it by going to school, basically. And most of us in theater, in theater studies who have done this, there, there's a handful. I'm really proud that, um, Laura, uh, in addition to Naomi and me, uh, Laura Milkey, who's English and KU has been, to the Institute for the Editing of Historical Documents, Camp Edit, as it's, as it's affectionately known. Um, a week-long institute uh, to help new documentary editors learn how to do these projects. It's a boot camp. Um, and so Laura has been to it, Mary Isbell at University of Connecticut. This week it's happening in Washington and get Kate Bredesen at Reed College is doing it. So there's a, there's a nice, there's a collective, collective of people who are working on documents who go to the institute and get trained. And it's an incredible opportunity. They basically pay you, you apply with your project and they pay you to come and learn. And, and so that's some, uh, I'd highly recommend you do that. But also the, a guide to documentary editing, which is in its third edition, and you will read bits of the introduction in the first chapter for our conversation tomorrow. Um, that's a great place to start in terms of learning more of this vocabulary and these practices. And then of course the TEI has its guidelines, its training, and um, I have not gone through this myself, but recently uh, a pair of, di of digital editors created an online course based on TEI that is free. So if you are at all curious, I encourage you to follow this link, check it out, skip around, view promiscuously um, or attentively and see if it, if it strikes you because that, I bet that's going to be a very helpful resource for, for all of us interested in TEI. And then finally, um, 
I wanted to end on, on teaching, it's just a few minutes, um, because I think we'll pick this up more tomorrow. I think that, of course, I'm excited um, that we're bringing this, this resource to scholars who are particularly interested in the 19th century, but also to theater historians generally. And honestly, to people like you who are interested in digital technologies and how they can change our work, um, whatever uh, period we're looking at or whatever resources that uh, strike our interest. But some of the most rewarding experiences have been as a teacher um, for me doing, during this project. And that's because this work, as you can imagine, often benefits from, from, the, from students we work with or other collaborators that we might find, volunteers too. Um, and so throughout our project, we've had work-study students work with us as editorial assistants. Naomi has been able to do that successfully. I'll, I'll share that I could not get a work-study student because there's a policy at Brooklyn College, apparently, that the work-study should not be used to support research <laughs> projects by faculty. And I don't know why that is, but but anyway, just beware that you may not, it's, it may not be an automatic thing, but, it, but also know that you, it doesn't hurt to ask because Naomi for three years, I think, had, three or four years had a work study student be her principal transcriber. And it's a great opportunity for a student on financial aid, is it not? Um, and because the digital humanities work is so uh, under supported, it's a way for us to get some important um, assistance with our work that's also a fulfilling experience for the student. We can also integrate uh, maybe micro documentary editing projects and coding projects into our undergraduate teaching. This is what has often been called a high impact practice when we involve our, re our undergraduates in research projects that actually will go somewhere instead of just having them write a paper that only their professor will read, maybe a peer reviewer in class. And, um, and the students that Naomi worked with in particular at LaGuardia Community College came up with amazing projects at the end of their experience. She did it for two semesters where they transcribed a volume of the diary and then had projects along the way um, inspired by the diary and shared them as part of their work in the class. And none of them had looked at a 19th century manuscript before. All of them had tremendous difficulty with handwriting. And then they learned how to read handwriting. And they learned TEI, what that is, what XML code is. I mean, just think of all the, the practical skills they got out of it, as well as sort of the intellectual stimulation uh, about history, about uh, manuscripts, and so forth. So, and then finally, in terms of graduate research, those of us who have the privilege of working with graduate students, obviously we're giving them important skills that they can apply to traditional academic career paths in terms of scholarship, but also alternative career tracks. Because there are um, so many libraries so many with digital humanities programs or collections, and there are, of course, many documentary editing projects that need people with these skills in digital editing and TEI. And so as an alternative career path for PhD students, for example, it can be a really great opportunity for them to work with a faculty member or mentor working on, on digital editing. So um, I, I think that anyone who, teach, who mentors graduate students or teaches a research methods class could and should consider integrating some kind of unit around um, text encoding so that they can have that career path open to them. This is an example of a student product, by the way. Um, the bit link, bitly link goes to a Flickr uh, a Flickr set, if you're curious, see, seeing photographs of sort of final presentation day. It's amazing, I think, to see the, the students and what they were doing. Um, but one of the products that one student did was create basically a, a, a glossary of Harry Watkins' handwriting. Um, because they had so much difficulty, and so they took images of what his Q looks, his capital Q, right? Very, very hard if you aren't familiar with 19th century handwriting, or um, the P here, the lowercase p, and for future students created this sort of key that they could refer to and use when transcribing. And it's something that Naomi and I would also use. <laughs> so, and this is something that the student came up with. There was another student who decided to work on the Harry Watkins Wikipedia page 
and learn wiki code and do some research to develop that. Um, there were students that created, uh, the, there was a student who made a song, wrote a song and performed at the last day of class about a, a particular story that, that Harry wrote about in a diary that struck him. Um, and, and many other things. So it, it was really rewarding to, um, in, on, the, in the, on the undergrad level, have them see what they would do with his diary. They did a lot. So we have a little more, we have a little time. We're, we were thinking of stopping around four. So uh, I wanted to ask you, in these last 15 or so minutes, what we could work on tomorrow that you feel a little vague on or want more information about as, as of now. So take a look at this list and let me know. Raise your hand if you, like is there something pressing, something that feels pressing or still confusing? Yeah, Mike. I don't know if this is a question, but it, as I'm thinking about a project, mm -hmm. um, my partner and I will be working on a variety of different source texts. Some of them are manuscripts uh, with all kinds of interesting annotations and corrections, uh, scripts that are really fascinating. And, and, and then we're also working with texts that have already been digitally encoded, but are crap. Okay. And, and, uh -huh. and, and in fact, we can recognize where there was a failure to huh. do best practices, but we don't have access to original digital manuscripts. So we have, a, we have oh. mixed kinds of things, and we're also mm -hmm. going to be working with a variety of genres, uh, some that are straight up dramatic text, others that are in fact musicals, which we feel like we need to be doing mm -hmm. some things there. So I, I, not necessarily a question, mm -hmm. but just a, a kind of a mixed source digital encoding project that we're thinking <coughs> about. Wow, well that sounds really great and important and hard. Yeah. Um, I just a few off the cuff thoughts I have are um, the TEI consortium has an amazing listserv where and many organizations do right, but there's a lot of dialogue about very specific thing problems like you're facing mm -hmm. with say you already have this poorly drafted transcription or or encoded text. Um, what what are some tools I could use to work with that? Um, or even more specifically, I'm dealing with a musical. Any best practices I should look at in terms of tagging? Because that comes up a lot. There are tags for dramatic texts. Um, for example, there's a tag for cast of characters. So you can mark where the cast of characters begins and where it ends. It's a, it might be a div, might be a nest, nested into div, I can't quite recall, but there are, there have been some conversations, luckily in the consortium and, and the folks that make it up, uh, around the kinds of texts that we deal with. At the same time, it, it can never be comprehensive, and the TEI list and other seminars would be a place where you could ask these questions about, what do I do with this text, this genre? Um, in terms of the text that is funky or not very good, um, that I don't know. I mean, the, it makes me think, though, of the Otis and Maud Skinner book that got me down this rabbit hole to begin with and how it, it, it was crappy, and that's why, uh, that's a reason why I decided to go through this trouble. Ten years later, it's coming out. I can't believe it's, like I said, it's ten years. Uh, but um, because I was in the archive and I saw how bad it was, the book was when I was reading the manuscript, I knew something had to be done. So even though it's challenging, I, I hope you will do it, and I think that people will have in the community good ideas to help spur you on. Yeah. And you're not limited to this. If you have other thoughts, please share them. But I just, I'm, I'm thinking about like making sure that I have met my goals mm -hmm. for this talk. Um, you know where to go. You want to learn more. Yes. What's your name? Uh, Jonah. Jonah. Um, yeah. So I'm thinking uh, that some of the training mm -hmm. would be really interesting. Just, just uh, this is a fairly new area for me. So okay. just having a, an idea. I'm thinking right now about sort of rolling around some different ideas for possible projects and uh, just knowing not only how to um, just where to go to get trained uh, the, the um, TEI and 
and um, also the software. So yeah. any of those those sorts of things. I mean, the best best practices are useful as well. But one thing I'm kind of looking at is like, for example, the DAWs roles that have been really interpreted a lot artistically, but not a whole lot theatrically. Mm -hmm. um, and mm -hmm. so how a lot of that has been digitized, but how do you um, then again using the best practices as well as um, implementing them um, so that you're digitally recognizing them and um, and able to uh, stock them on these sites and then able to work with them yeah. and maintain them. I guess that's yeah. I'm glad that you you said this because this is this. I'm so glad that we took the time to before we even started to just get trained and that's sort of what I think many of you are doing even by being here in Atlanta. So good for you. I'm sorry, in Athens, not Atlanta. Um, <laughs> but. Uh, but I, I, I would share that I'm an unwilling digital humanist. I really am. I, I did this project and I learned these things because I had a purpose and a mission with this document that I had found that I believed needed to become more widely available. And yet, and it was the training, it was the experiences uh, of mentorship and instruction that d made me decide to actually take the plunge. Mm -hmm. And it's another reason I'm here, is that I had these positive experiences and I want to be a resource for all of you because you're my, you're my people. Mm -hmm. And for, in whatever way I can be useful, I want to keep talking and sharing resources with you. Um, but as I said, uh, the, institute, the annual Institute for Editing Historical Documents is tremendously helpful. And every year, the digital component becomes more intense in that institute because it's just required. You know, Now every grant program is asking, how are you going to make your documents accessible um, and, and available to a wide audience? One thing I, I don't know that they're doing, that I hope they're doing, and if they're not, we need to pressure them, is thinking about the other definition of accessible, which is accessible to a wide range of, of learning and modalities and, 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 and ability, right? Mm -hmm. So this is something that Scott, thank goodness, is very attentive to and invested in professionally. I would encourage you and your collaborators to also make that part of your conversation and your planning. And in any training you seek, try and find, find out to what extent are we going to be trained in making our products accessible to a wide range of users, not just in terms of education or interest, but also um, sight, hearing, yeah. learning difference, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. so, um, so yes, anyway. Institute for Annual Institute that ADE sponsors and funded by the NHPRC. Uh, again, you get paid to go, so there's no downside except that it's your time. Uh, I, I, you should also, I think, check out that online course that I showed you. It looks really promising. It's also in different languages. I think it's in three languages. Um, and it has captions. That's a nice thing that makes it accessible, too. Um, there's also uh, the DHSI, the D Digital Humanities Summer Institute, which is held in Victoria, Canada, every British Columbia, every summer, which I've never been to, but I've always wanted to. It's an amazing, uh, I think, two-week uh, series of workshops uh, that uh, cover a wide range of projects, not just digital editing, um, although there's always a workshop on editing which is what I'm looking at, obviously, <coughs> and doing, but other kinds of digital humanities projects. Really an outstanding opportunity there, and it's in the summer. Um, and there are, there are funding opportunities associated with it, so you can seek those. Um, and then the TEI uh, often will have events on that web page that I gave you the URL for, regional events, where you can go to a university that has a digital humanities center and get different kinds of training. And Naomi and Scott both attended TEI seminars or workshops um, at a regional sort of conference or symposium. And I never had to do it, so I actually am less well-versed in TEI than they are. Um, but luckily they did it and they, they really are, that experience helped us move the project forward. So those are just a few of the resources. Um, but uh, I think more and more instruction is becoming available online. So keeping your eye on these professional associations websites that I shared with you, the ADE, the MLA Committee on Digital Editing, the TEI, will be, a, will be good resources for you. Other thoughts, questions? Yes, what's your name? Uh, Catherine. <coughs> Catherine. Um, so you said other languages, so I have two questions. One um, is, are languages that are not in a Romanized script 
part of this project. So Chinese, Japanese, um, various kinds of, um, I mean, it's quite different with Arabic, but mm -hmm. um, is this also work or are, they, you know, do they go that? Because it wouldn't work ABC, you know? Yeah, <laughs> I, I do not know um, specifically anything about, and it, but I think it's only because I haven't sought them out. Mm. I imagine that if you went to, if you joined the, the, the TEI listserv, there are conversations about markup. And I think I have seen, for example, how do you interpret a medieval manuscript that has, for example, yeah, 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 yeah. And, yeah, and people are doing that with TEI guidelines or under TEI guidelines. So I know that work is being done, though I can't, unfortunately, at, right now, point yeah. to specific projects. Oh, that's, I never thought about illuminating. Because yeah. one, of, one of the things is, um, I, I work mostly in Northeast Asia, and, and Japan is an archive country. I mean, something happened in, you know, 1604, they, someone was making a note about it. Mm. <laughs> but unfortunately, it was written, um, and then when they went to printing, it changed what was written, and then they also have illustrations all through these, which is, which means that there's always more than yeah. just text. written text. Mm -hmm. have, have, so I was wondering about um, other types of visualizations that might be in a journal, uh, yeah, a description, yeah. and that it's a really goes good up question. to, I mean, 19, well, before you know, we were still typewriting and stuff, like the uh, Buto Hijikata has these things called Butofu, which are written, drawn, pasted, collaged um, works, and I'm wondering, well, how do you work with these layers of um, communication? Yeah, yeah, I, that's a great question. If people aren't doing that, you should do it. Because, okay. um, because one thing I do know in terms of manuscripts transcription, TEI does have standards in place guiding us how to note, um, for example, text on a page written in a different hand. So you can, it's, and I've seen this, there's wow. sort of young Harry and old Harry in oh. his diary because he went back in the 1880s, we think, based on various bits of evidence in the, in the manuscript and revised parts of it, made changes added pages, removed pages. Mm -hmm. And even though we um, have not, we, for our purposes, we felt that was not important enough to, to in, encode. We considered using the hand tag in order to note that. Um, in the end, we decided not to because uh, we felt like pretty confident that this was not, this was old Harry versus young Harry, but never enough to responsibly and unequivocally mark it as such, because that's an editorial intervention, right? That's an analog, an, an, a bit of analysis that I think when you're encoding text, you have to be careful and cautious of. Um, so that's why we did, that's an example of something we didn't do, but we considered it because there are structures in TEI that allow you to really fine tune your analysis and, and your rendering of the manuscript. Um, in the article tomorrow morning, uh, towards the theory of digital editions, there's a discussion of the the Jane. Oh, help me. There's a there's a project discussed there, where it's a, a woman novelist who's famous, and I just I, yeah, I think that's that's yeah. exactly, and uh, <laughs> and you can because it's been rendered in uh, there's different versions, many different versions Ooh, of yeah. many literary greats works, right? And and TEI allows us to encode in things in ways, and even manuscripts that have been edited over time, you can, you can mark that up in your text, in your transcription. Mm -hmm. and, and there are tools to do that. I imagine in, in sort of work you're talking about too, you could do that, but you may have to create a custom schema that would reflect that data. And, and what, just, just connected to that, yeah. um, this idea of open access is not global. Mm. Um, you know, like we're working towards that, but for example, this particular um, group of people, it's at Keio University, they, um, it's really hard to convince them that the work should be accessible. <laughs> uh, do people work with that or, or, you know, just that? You mean the, the, the it, We all just say, oh, it's wonderful, it should be accessible, but, mm. you know, in a lot of places, you know, owning something or guarding something and the preciousness of something, um, do you have to work across that both ethical spaces? Well, I'm not sure I'm answering your, your query 
specifically, but I can share that I, in the last summer, was contacted by descendants of Harry Watkins' brother, George. Okay. okay. Yeah. And I had a long interview with them in which they told me that what they know about the family. Now, most of us know that we, we, have, we probably, most of us have family stories that have been passed down to us, and, and we probably also know they're not 100% accurate. How could they be, <laughs> right? Yeah. yeah. And the stories I was hearing from Ralph and, and, and Angela and Lori, I was like, wow, I've spent hours in the archive looking at city directories, and I know they're wrong. <laughs> But I need them <laughs> to help me, right? And, and so we're navigating relationships all the time in our work, is what I'm trying to say. And, and every project is different. And, and it's the relationships, the, however, that make the project happen or not. And, and it's, it can be very difficult. So far, they still like me. They live here in Georgia, because George was in Georgia. Uh, I may I may meet them on Thursday. We'll, we'll see, but but um, but again, like on a case by case basis, we probably have to deal with these ethics yeah, and these yeah, and the obstacles we confront around um, what kind of gets published, what gets what's owned. Yeah. I have a theater survey article coming out in October um, about Harry Watkins. It's it's obviously inspired by the diary, but it's like my own scholarship on Harry and a specific story he tells in the diary and. The photograph that appears as figure three is from the Thomason family, these folks I'm telling you about. Mm -hmm. And that picture, which they sent to me last summer, made my argument. Like, I would not, wow. it was amazing. I, I cried. I got, they emailed me the photograph of him, which is his, he and his family in the parlor of their New York City home. And this, this article is about a sword that an audience gave him in 1853 as a sort of admiring token of respect. And I knew he treasured this, or I had this hunch. He never brings it up again in the diary, but I, all the other research I did around gift presentations in the 19th century theater and so on and so on made me think this really mattered to him. And there I zoomed in on the image, and there it was, leaning against the wall right next to him, the sword. I had no idea what it looked like, it looked like until that moment. I had worked so hard to figure out. And it was because of this family that contacted me through Facebook, because Harry's on Facebook, by the way, Twitter, Facebook, <laughs> it's totally networked, um, and, and it's because of Facebook that I met them, and, and these relationships really can transform what we can do. Yeah. So, um, yeah, thank good, you know, I thank God every day for Naomi and Scott and all the students who've worked with us, Shane, Christine, Danielle, uh, et cetera, and, um, and the Thomasons, too, who've come out of the woodwork, so it can't be just one person. Chase. Can you talk a little bit about the, how you cultivated the relationship with the archivists and sort of the library to get the permissions? I know you said they were very eager to let you do this, um, but sort of what that Great question. Was okay. So, it, it, do you mind if we keep going for a few more minutes? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. So, because um, this, this will hopefully be helpful. The manuscript lives at Harvard, obviously. Harvard has a press. A lot of times people have said, why are you going with Michigan? Hmm. Because... Harvard has a press. Well, as you may know, uh, Harvard Theater Collection did not have a curator for years. So I was just working with the really brilliant staff there, but no one who could really state an opinion about whether or not they wanted the diary that belongs in their archive to be published by Harvard. And I had a relationship already with, with Michigan, because my first book, and um, I talk, we, we talked to several publishers, but in the end went with Michigan, as I said, because they have this outstanding digital humanities program. And, um, and when Matt Whitman finally did come on board, he, he asked the same question, like, I feel like we should be doing this. And I said, well, do you have the infrastructure to do the digital edition? Because that's just as important as the print. And he was like, no, Harvard isn't there yet. So in the end, I, we're really lucky that um, I mean, obviously it's in the public domain, it's an unpublished manuscript, there's no copyright issues, but of course, out of courtesy, we want them to be happy as well, because we need them. Um, but because of, we continued to talk with them and keep them posted and continue that dialogue, um, in the end, they totally understood why we made the decision that we did. And then Matt, out of his own budget, because he still cares very much about the project, and we've, we've been talking every year forever, it seems like, um, he said, I'm just, I have this budget, we, I care so much about this, why don't we just give you, you know, tell us what you need, we'll scan it, 
give you the rights to publish it, etc. And and it's because he, luckily for us, sees that this is part of the mi the collection's mission, mm -hmm. that we're advancing their mission through this publication mm -hmm. digitally and in print, and this is a way that they can support it. So, um, so we're really like beside ourselves that they'll do this with us. And but again, this goes back to a theme I'm sure has been a theme in just two days, which is collaboration is how these projects work. And that began, began, this one began with Betty Falsey believing me when there was no evidence that the diary was there, you know? Like she, I just kept, Betty, please. I was like a grad student. Please, could you just look maybe here? And, because I had the curatorial file, blah, blah, blah. Um, but it started with her and then I just feel so, I'm so grateful that so many other people have cared and helped advance this project. And we've maintained those relationships, mm -hmm. you know. Mm -hmm. Sarah is one of those relationships, frankly, like Sarah's on our advisory board, so, it, and that's the reason I'm sure I'm here. So it's like these, even, even this week, these two weeks, the people in this room, I think, could be those crucial people that um, make a project go forward. Um, is that a good note to end on? Mm -hmm. good. Excellent. Excellent, let's end on that. Right. Thank you. Very graciously offered to have lunch with any of you who is interested in having lunch with her.